um, I think it's uh, it's uh, time to start. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, this very special event. Uh, this is the first in a series of events uh, devoted to the Russian aggression on Ukraine and its consequences uh, for Europe. Uh, my name is Grzegorz Rekert. I'm the director of the Center for European Studies at, uh, and professor of government um, uh, at Harvard. Now, um, I would like to thank uh, co-sponsors uh, of this uh, event, uh, uh, which are the Europe in the World Seminar, uh, Davis Center for Russian and Euro-Asian Studies, and Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, the center staff uh, for uh, their hard work on this event, especially uh, I would like to thank Kerry, Kale, and, um, and Michael. Uh, we have uh, um, a great panel today, um, and the panelists will offer uh, uh, some perspectives coming uh, from uh, very different uh, parts uh, of Europe and different parts uh, of the world. Uh, since we uh, have a very limited time, I'm not going to uh, provide uh, extensive um, um, you know, introduction uh, of our speakers, uh, but I will just briefly uh, mention a couple uh, of things about, about them. Now, um, Mary Sarotti uh, is a Krevis Chair at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies in Washington, D.C., uh, she is also research associate of the Center for European Studies and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Mary is a historian of modern Europe and Cold War, and her uh, highly acclaimed books uh, shaped our understanding of the of the end of the Cold War. Uh, those books were named by the, the Economist and Financial Times uh, books uh, of the year. Um, Mary earned her academic degrees from Harvard and from uh, Yale University. Uh, uh, our next uh, uh, panelist is Sigmar Gabriel, uh, who is the chairman of the Atlantic Brücke. He's one of the most uh, accomplished and influential European politicians. Uh, he held several leading posts in the German government, most recently uh, as a Minister of Foreign Affairs, 2017-2018, uh, and Vice Chancellor of Germany. 2013 to 2018. Uh, prior to that, he was German, uh, Germany's Minister of Economic Affairs and Energy and Federal Minister of Environment. Uh, Gabriel was one of the longest serving leaders of the Social Democratic Party, uh, uh, being the leader from 2009 to 2017. Uh, he's also a senior fellow uh, at the Center for European Studies. Uh, Dimitris. Karidis is a professor of international politics at Pantheon University in Athens, and he is one of the most influential public intellectuals uh, and a regular TV political commentator uh, in Greece. Uh, since 2019, he is the member of the Hellenic uh, Parliament. Uh, he is also a senior fellow at the Karamanlis Foundation and has been directing various programs on international relations in Greece. Uh, including Navarino Network, uh, which is the public policy think tank based in Thessaloniki. Uh, Dimitris uh, was our colleague here at Harvard, um, serving as the director of COCALIS program at the Kennedy School of uh, Government. <coughs> he also, uh, was the professor, uh, Karamanlis professor at uh, Fletcher School of uh, Diplomacy. Uh, what we are going to do uh, today, uh, uh, I, I ask our panelists to uh, start with a very short uh, few minutes uh, comments, and then I will moderate uh, the discussion. Uh, we also hope uh, to accept some questions from the audience. Uh, now, I will group those questions and, and uh, uh, to, in order to make our discussion more, uh, more flexible. Now, the chats uh, uh, will not be open. Uh, so if you have uh, a question, please um, uh, pose this question through Q&A uh, channel. Uh, we have a huge audience today, uh, more than 400 people. Uh, so if you want to uh, uh, really uh, ask the question, uh, probably doing this sooner rather than later is, is a good idea. Um, so now let me let me turn to uh, Mary Sarotti uh, for the introductory remarks. Mary, uh, the floor is yours, please. 
Yes, it's good to be with you, even though the cause is obviously a very sad one. And I have to start by expressing my admiration for the bravery of the Ukrainians uh, resisting the aggression from Russia. It is truly remarkable. And uh, I um, am really in awe of the way they are resisting this terrible aggression. I am also heartbreak, I'm also heartbroken by the title of our event today, Europe at War. My background, as many of you may know, is as a historian of the Cold War. And I am used to looking at images of war in Europe, but they are historical images. So it has been a, a surreal experience for me to see the kind of images, and not just for me, but for everyone, to see these images and realize they are not historical, but current. Uh, the um, experience has also been particularly strange for me since, as you're kind enough to mention, I've, I've written a number of histories of the Cold War and post-Cold War period. And the most recent one of those is called Not One Inch, America, Russia, and the Making of Post-Cold War Stalemate. And uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin has, of course, been using that phrase, not one inch, repeatedly in press conferences to justify brutalizing Ukraine. That, of course, in no way justifies uh, brutalizing Ukraine. It, he's instrumentalizing history for his own purposes. But it has meant that there is now a renewed focus in both Washington and in Europe on the history of the post-Cold War period, on the history of NATO enlargement, on the history of the fight between Washington and Moscow over NATO enlargement, and in particular over this controversy that gave rise to the title of my book, The Not One Inch Controversy. So it, it has been a very, very strange and surreal time for me as well, obviously not nearly as strange and surreal as for the Ukrainians. And I think what is happening now is a combination of Putin's accumulated historic grievances, both about the way that in his belief, Russians and Ukrainians belong in the same uh, state. He does not think Ukraine deserves to be a separate state or nation. Obviously the Ukrainians feel very differently. So there's his historical grievances about Ukraine, but then there are also his historical grievances about the way that the post-Cold War European security order turned out to be so disadvantageous to Russia and in particular about how far uh, NATO enlarged. So there's this mixture of these uh, historical grievances and then his willingness to use brutality currently. I think it's important to remember that Putin's grievances come not just out of living history, but out of lived history. He was, of course, as many of you may know, a junior KGB officer in the uh, East German city of Dresden in 1989. He witnessed the collapse of Soviet power in East Germany firsthand. He was horrified by it. He wanted to use violence to resist it. He wanted to shoot peaceful protesters who came to the KGB outpost in Dresden. And he called for military backup from Soviet troops in East Germany. And the person who answered the phone refused to provide Putin with that backup, saying, I will not authorize the use of force without explicit authorization from Moscow, and Moscow is silent. And Putin has long repeated that that phrase, Moscow is silent, has haunted him, uh, that he feels the Soviet Union should have pushed back violently and retained its position in Central and Eastern Europe. And clearly Moscow is not silent today. So there's a, a lot of history involved in the events of today. Uh, before this event, you asked to talk, uh, me to talk briefly about the mood in Washington where I work at the Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Um, if there is any good to come out of this terrible tragedy, it is the fact that uh, Western cohesion is now much stronger than it was a month ago. Even countries such as Poland and Hungary, where there had been deep disputes over uh, de-democratization in those countries, even those countries have been working closely together with NATO allies. Poland in particular has been extraordinarily welcoming, as you know, Jay Gorsz, to uh, refugees. I just saw in the Financial Times today that Poland has now the second biggest refugee population of any country in the world. And uh, President Biden is, of course, going to Poland on Friday. So that is a um, dramatic improvement in relations between Poland and its NATO partners. So I think the sense of cohesion and unity, both within NATO and within the sanction regime, is something to be welcomed. As I said, one of the few positive signs. There are also signs that may even help with the American domestic divide because while it's not complete, obviously there are outliers like Tucker Carlson, there is widespread agreement that what is happening is horrific and is wrong. 
So from the point of view of Washington, uh, there are some positive effects. The big question now, and I'll end on this, is how to support the Ukrainians without escalating to nuclear war. I wrote a New York Times op-ed on this a couple of weeks ago. That is the challenge. On the one hand, we need to remember what uh, uh, many of us learned, many of us who remember the Cold War learned, that we must avoid escalation to thermonuclear conflict because that would be civilization ending. Even though it's been 30 years since uh, the, what we must now call the old Cold War, Washington and Moscow still control more than 90% of the nuclear warheads on the planet. They are the only two countries in that category. They're the only two countries that can devastate life on Earth and end civilization. During the Cold War, we had a popular awareness of what that means, but I fear that popular awareness is lost. So we must always keep that in mind. I, I think there's not really a sufficient popular understanding of just how dangerous things have gotten how quickly in the past month. But on the other hand, what is happening in Ukraine is utterly abhorrent and utterly unacceptable. And so we need to find ways to help the Ukrainians below that threshold of escalation to thermonuclear war. Now that is a big challenge, but the good news is that the United States and the West has uh, done this before. It was called the Cold War. And we had 40 years of experience in uh, pushing back against the Soviet Union without escalating to thermonuclear war. So we are going to need all of those skills again. We're going to need European studies and we're going to need nuclear strategy and the history of the Cold War era. And so I'm very grateful to CES for supporting all of those things and having this series at this critical moment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Mary. Um, Germany is uh, uh, perhaps uh, next to the US the most important uh, uh, country in, uh, uh, in, in trying to uh, discourage Russia from, uh, from brutality and uh, from this uh, invasion. Uh, so let me uh, give floor to Sigmar Gabriel at this point. First of all, thank you very much for <clears throat> inviting me to this debate, although um, it's actually terrible that we are talking uh, about a war in Europe. And um, I think, uh, of course, it's unbearable for every observer that we have to largely stand by and watch the people in Ukraine die because we did not found the answer to the question of uh, what we just heard, what to do and not to, go, not to enter the danger of a nuclear war. Um, you asked me, Germany, was important to um, to do something um, not, not to bring Russia to this terrible war, but we failed. And maybe that's the difference to the old Cold War. And maybe this is the, the, the starting point of our misunderstanding during the last years. We always thought that Russia is more or less um, equal to the former Soviet Union. And I think this is a big misunderstanding and was a big misunderstanding because the Soviet Union was a status quo power. And it's not so difficult to negotiate with a status quo power. Russia is a revisionist power. And we, 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 we had the chance to see this when they, how, when they acted in Georgia or in Aleppo and in other parts or 2014 in Crimea. But we always thought especially when it comes to our energy um, dependency on Russia. Nah, our experience out of the Cold War is that the Soviet Union, um, they delivered S and Goyle. They were predictable, uh, even in the darkest times of the Cold War. And this is not the case any longer. Um, I think, uh, looking a bit on a broader picture, that we are only at the beginning of a global struggle and fight about what the new world order will look like after the end of the Pax Americana. Ahead of us probably is a decade of global insecurity, a decade of peacelessness. This does not mean that a real kinetic war break out again and again, as it currently is the case in Ukraine, but trade conflicts, sanctions, cyber attacks, misinformation, and military violence will characterize the coming years. And for the first time, and that's also the difference to the first Cold War in the 20th century. It's done in Europe and not in other parts of the world. The conflict is not a Western confrontation with Russia or a US-led democracy 
uh, fight against Russia. Rather, it is a conflict over a rule-based order in which nations guarantee each other's territorial integrity, regardless of their social or political orientation. Russia has broken this minimum standards of the international order. If this, that catches on, other examples will follow. I think it's important to say this again and again, because there are some parts of the world who would be not interested in this conflict if it's perceived at a conflict between the West and Russia, then there are others who would say, okay, two imperialist powers are fighting with each other. What, what does this have to do with us? It's an international conflict about minimum standards in the global order. And that's the reason <clears throat> I was very happy to see that more than 140 nations in the UN General Assembly uh, voted against Russia, with what, which was uh, um, astonishing. And only uh, Syria, Eritrea, and I think Belarus was, uh, was, were, were on the side of Russia. I think, of course, Russia can defeat Ukraine militarily, but it has already lost politically and economically. I think Russia has become the outlaw of world politics. It's not North Korea, yes. Its economic potential and its military power is strong enough to find economic cooperation partners in developing countries or countries like China. But however the, the outcome of this war will be, Russia will be a shadow of itself at the end. Um, this makes the situation not easier, maybe more dangerous, because I think Vladimir Putin is a guy who recognized this weakness of Russia. He saw that he had a miscalculation how fast he could win in Ukraine. Um, he saw that uh, all his ideas about the, uh, the end of Western democracies, uh, that this did not happen. We, ha we are stronger than uh, decades ago. Uh, a year ago, we debated in Europe about the brain dead of NATO. Uh, we had an American president who questioned uh, the membership of NATO. Today, uh, we have a very strong ally alliance uh, in Europe and together with the United States. So Putin sees that all his calculations went wrong. Uh, and my fear is that this will bring him to more, um, to, to, to even da more dangerous events to test this unity of the West and therefore, I, I very much appreciate that the United States president is coming to Europe um, and to, de to debate with allies uh, how we can stay united. And of course, there are differences about what we should do to support Ukraine between, for example, the east uh, part of the European Union and the western part. And the biggest danger today, I would say, is uh, that tests through Putin and his guys in Moscow would bring us to frictions and to internal debates in the Western Alliance and the European Alliance. This is the, the biggest danger in these days. Uh, and I hope that uh, the visit of the United States president uh, will strengthen the alliance in, in, in Europe and together with the United States. At the end, I don't think that we are close to something like a ceasefire or end of war. Unfortunately, I hope that I'm wrong. I really hope I'm wrong, but I can't see any reason why Putin should stop at this point his war. I think we will see more blood. I think he will try to get uh, Kiev and uh, to bring the government uh, out of Kiev. And then possibly he would say, okay, I reached my, my, my targets. Uh, we had the so-called denazification and the genocide, so-called genocide against Russians are stopped. And then maybe he is willing to negotiate with the US or uh, um, uh, maybe also with China. But until, until now and, and during the next weeks and months, I can't see any uh, reason why uh, he should stop his aggression against the neighboring country. And this is a bitter tooth for the Ukrainians who really fight in a brave way 
uh, where I would not be sure of every Western, uh, West European country would do it in the same way. Uh, uh, but because we are all afraid about entering a nuclear confrontation with Russia, I can't see that by military means we could stop Russia going further uh, in Ukraine. So the only chance we have is really to sanctionize, to weaponize the dollar and the euro, euro against Russia, and of course to deliver financial support and military to support it to the Ukrainians. That's the state of play, how I see it. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Dimitris, how the situation looks uh, from your vantage point in Southern Europe? Very bad, uh, I have to say. Uh, first of all, allow me to thank you for this very kind uh, and uh, honorary uh, invitation, honoring invitation, uh, to be in such a, a panel with uh, so many prestigious uh, co-panelists. Um, Mr. Gabriel has many friends in uh, Greece uh, from his time in power, and I was just speaking with an old professor of mine, Mr. Venizelos, uh, uh, who sends his regard. Uh, he was uh, uh, vice uh, prime minister uh, in Greece uh, um, in the recent past, and uh, yes. And of course, uh, we have all read uh, 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 the books of uh, Professor Sarotti and uh, uh, your own, uh, Gregor. So thank you very much. Now, it seems to me, it seems to us uh, to confirm what uh, has just been said. And I have been listening uh, in Washington where I was recently uh, within a Greek delegation meeting with senators and uh, congressmen and people from the State Department and the defense that we are all tra trapped in, Putin, in Putin's big mistake and big miscalculation. Uh, he has failed politically for sure, no matter what the outcome of uh, uh, the military confrontation is, but it seems to me that even militarily he is faced with uh, unexpected difficulties. Uh, the heroic Ukrainian resistance has turned this into a much more protract protracted protracted conflict, a war of attrition, uh, than uh, it, it was initially uh, planned. And the fear is that uh, Mr. Putin, being Mr. Putin, uh, will uh, um, try to use uh, uh, some uh, dramatic uh, gesture to break the impasse and to break uh, the resistance and the morale of the Ukrainian government and the Ukrainian people. And so there is uh, uh, a increased talk uh, about the use of uh, non-conventional, uh, mainly uh, chemical uh, weapons, which will be a further uh, un unprecedented escalation uh, uh, in this conflict. So, the talk both in Washington, in Brussels, uh, in Athens, obviously, is how to find a way out of this uh, paranoia uh, that has uh, engulfed the Kremlin and how to offer a path uh, to de-escalate um, uh, to Putin. But obviously, we, we have not been able to find uh, such a path so far, and here we are. Uh, I'm afraid that we are only the beginning of what's going to be a, a big tragedy. Even if we avoid escalation and the involvement of uh, neighboring countries, which is a big if, uh, given the pressures already um, produced, uh, the humanitarian crisis, the refugee crisis, and the uh, unpredictability of Mr. Uh, Putin, uh, I think we are dealing with a devastated Ukraine and a destabilized uh, and surely impoverished Russia uh, with whatever this entails for global uh, stability, uh, peace and uh, security. <laughs> Russia is not North Korea, it's not a marginal player, it's a basic pillar of the international system, it's the biggest country on earth, it is the biggest nuclear superpower, it has more uh, nuclear warheads than any other nation, uh, more even than the United States. It is a permanent member of the United Nations and it can uh, paralyze uh, the UN as it has already done. Now, 
Uh, I am in the Council of Europe, uh, Parliamentary Assembly representing Greece. We have recently decided to expel uh, Russia from the Council. The only countries that voted, uh, uh, did not vote for that out of 47 was Serbia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and the only NATO country, Turkey. And I think it's indicative uh, of uh, the broad consensus in Europe uh, of uh, there were 42 out of 47, a huge majority uh, against, uh, uh, against uh, Russia. Now, as far as Greece is concerned, uh, obviously I come from a country that until recently felt very close to Russia uh, for historical and uh, cultural and religious uh, uh, reasons. Uh, there has been a large uh, Greek community in Russia and in the Black Sea. My father was born uh, in the Russian Black Sea himself, and I still remember my grandparents talking Russia, Russian at home. Uh, and uh, many, many others, especially uh, people who came after the disintegration of the Soviet Union in the 90s to uh, Greece. And obviously, historically, uh, Russia was a counterweight to Turkey, as you probably uh, know, there are famous Russia-Turkish wars uh, from the time of uh, Peter the Great all the way to the First World uh, War. And there is the Orthodox religion, and there is the economics, uh, and there is the energy. So there have been a lot, a lot of connections, so much so that in a 2017 opinion poll, uh, Vladimir Putin came first in Greece as the most popular world leader, much more than most, than all Greek leaders, with 75% popularity. That was in 2017. I'm saying this uh, to, to, to tell you that if Greece has turned so much against the Russian regime and the Russian government's decision and Vladimir Putin, uh, you can see the sea change uh, in uh, views in Europe vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Russia. And now the popularity of Putin is around 20%, still high, but nothing compared to the astronomical 75% only five years uh, ago. This is because the Greek government and uh, the main political parties, I have to admit, uh, have taken a very strict and clear position against the Russian invasion. From the very first moment, the Greek prime minister was adamant for both principle and self-interest reasons. Uh, um, Greece is a country that uh, uh, has come out of, uh, come into modern existence uh, through a revolution, a liberal democratic revolution against an empire, and has always sided uh, uh, on the, let me allow what we say here in Greece, the correct side of history, both in the two world wars and the Cold War. And uh, it has continued to uh, uh, be, uh, uh, to, 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 to exercise a foreign policy based on law uh, respect for human rights, uh, integrity of states and sovereignty and so on and so forth, but also self-interest because we don't want revisionism, we don't want revanchism, we don't want the forceful change of borders. We already have a big problem with the Turkish uh, threat uh, to our east and we don't want this to be validated through a successful Russian campaign uh, with the West doing nothing. So we are encouraged by the unity, as uh, our professor has just mentioned, and the cohesion of the Western Alliance that would not have been, uh, it should not have been, should not be taken for granted. Uh, allow me just to say that if Donald Trump had been re-elected in 2020, I doubt uh, that the uh, uh, United States uh, would be in NATO today uh, to be able for the US president to come to Brussels in an emergency uh, summit and uh, reconfirm uh, that uh, unity. The things had got uh, perilously close to having the United States abandon uh, the transatlantic alliance with everything that might this might have entailed uh, for the stability and security of uh, Europe. And we are particularly encouraged by the German decision uh, for rearmament. Uh, 
uh, that signifies a, a broader geostrategic emancipation of Europe. Uh, I want to underline the fact that this was a decision taken by a center-left government, uh, by a SPD chancellor, with broad political support from all main parties in Germany. So it has a bipartisan, long-term, uh, strategic uh, backing uh, behind it. And of course, there is Finland and Sweden, and even Switzerland, for the first time after two centuries, has chosen sides, which speaks volumes uh, about where uh, we are. This is the one uh, uh, good uh, uh, positive thing coming out of this very, very dark uh, moment. Russia is trying to counteract. It has used the Russian party, quote unquote, inside Europe to try to destabilize governments here in Greece uh, with various uh, um, um, agents, uh, the internet, uh, the media, uh, even friendly political formations, let me put it uh, this way. We have seen uh, a reaction when it comes to the church. Uh, the Ecumenical Patriarchate of uh, Constantinople uh, is a, a primary victim of that Russian attack because they were the ones who recognized uh, uh, the autocephaly of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church back in 2019, which was a big offense to the uh, Patriarchate of Moscow's prerogatives over Ukrainian Orthodox uh, population. We see a big competition with Moscow in Africa between the Moscow Patriarchate and the Patriarchate of Alexandria or the Patriarchate of Jerusalem. It's a fascinating and very interesting and underreported uh, competition from influ for influence, which brings the Greeks at the forefront of the struggle to counteract uh, Russia's penetration and influence in uh, these parts of uh, the world. And obviously, uh, there is economic pressure with energy. Tourism has ceased from Russia. It was a big uh, part of Greek uh, uh, revenues. And people are very anxious about the inflation uh, that is uh, 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 coming out, let alone the very bizarre threats from the Russian embassy here in Athens, and even from the Russian foreign ministry spokeswoman, Mrs. Zaharova, who has come out to threaten the Greeks with retaliations if they don't behave, and they, if they don't comply with the historical prerogatives of Greek-Russian uh, friendship. So here we are, but we are very determined. We sent even military uh, aid to Ukraine, let alone humanitarian. It is something that is very close to us. Uh, the Ukrainian border is closer to our northern border than to Crete. Uh, we have uh, uh, thousands of uh, ethnic Greeks under threat uh, in Mariupol. Uh, the, uh, um, uh, the, the martyrdom of whom has moved uh, every uh, Greek together with the martyrdom of the rest of the Ukrainian people. But there are more than 100,000 uh, Ukrainian citizens of ethnic Greek descent in, uh, in the wider area of Mariupol. So it is a conflict that is very close, uh, very moving, uh, and very, very upsetting. Uh, to us here in, uh, uh, in the South. We are worried about, uh, uh, about uh, some powers um, getting used to it and kind of forgetting. And uh, United States is always, you know, fascinating politics. Uh, we have to see and wait what happens in the midterm and then in 2024. So there are question marks about this cohesion and unity and uh, forthcomingness of the Western Alliance. But here we are today. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much, Dimitris. Um, uh, we have lively discussion going on uh, on the Q uh, and uh, A um, uh, side, uh, but uh, let me ask uh, a question to each of you uh, uh, at this point. You know, using the opportunity of having Mary uh, here in this panel, I would like to uh, uh, really ask a, a historical question. Now, Putin's justification for his brutal attack on, on Ukraine rests on, on three ideas, basically. Uh, uh, one are the loony fantasies about uh, history of Russia and relations with uh, 
uh, with her neighbors, uh, um, you know, ideas of uh, Rashid Mir uh, and so on. The second idea are completely false accusations of the uh, Ukrainian government to commit genocide uh, against its own people. Um, and the third idea are those grievances vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the West, uh, which you uh, mentioned uh, uh, at the beginning of our conversation. Now, no one knows more than you uh, about uh, about uh, what happened after the end of Cold War. Uh, is there any credibility uh, in um, uh, in what Putin is uh, uh, is telling us? Uh, uh, um, is a reason that those complaints uh, uh, are, uh, you know, have have some uh, uh, elements of, of truth in it. Uh, um, so, Mary. Yeah, so um, let me preface this by saying that I was already on the record years ago as referring to Putin as a grim and murderous leader. So I, I have no sympathy for the Putin regime. I, uh, um, I know there are many, I have many Russian friends who are horrified by what is happening. Many of them are trying to get out of Russia. So I have no sympathy for Putin. I need to make that clear. Um, the big issue in the post-Cold War era was the status of Russia. And uh, regardless of what we think of Putin, and to repeat, I think very little of him, uh, that question remains, right? Russia is the largest country on earth by landmass. It is part of Europe. And in the post-Cold War era, there was no defined place for Russia in the European security order. Again, this is no question of doing this because we like the Putin regime. This is just a question of practicality. When you have a, you know, one of the biggest military powers in the world in your geographic region, you, you, it's hard to, you know, proceed without a sustainable position for it. And so the post-Cold War era witnessed this tragic arc, which I describe in my book, Not One Inch, from the unexpected moment of deliverance from the thermonuclear conflict represented by the success of the Solidarity Protest Movement, the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, the um, collapse of, of the Soviet Union subsequently, and the beginning of true cooperation between Washington and Moscow. As Moscow was democratizing and becoming a market economy, it also engaged in far-reaching nuclear disarmament together with Washington. That was, of course, the greatest moment of disarmament since the dawn of the atomic age. Now, this wasn't simply altruistic. Uh, Russia was trying to either destroy or, or somehow take possession of parts of the former Soviet nuclear arsenal that had landed outside its territory at the breakup moment of the Soviet Union. Uh, as many people on this, call, on this call will know, because of that, Ukraine was born nuclear. Ukraine became the fourth largest, excuse me, the third largest nuclear power in the world immediately upon becoming independent because of the sheer amount of nuclear arsenal left over from the Soviet Union on its territory. Now, it's important to add that command and control of that arsenal was in Moscow, not in Kyiv. So the Ukrainians had physical possession of the weapons, but not command and control. But there was a lot of technological savvy in Ukraine. It had been the place where many uh, Soviet missiles and planes had been built. And presumably with enough time and money, Ukraine could have, um, could have basically taken command of those missiles. But Ukraine decided to give them up in exchange for economic aid, a question, a, a decision that uh, many Ukrainians are now regretting. It was a necessary one at the time because the Ukrainian economy was in free fall and it needed the support. But obviously now there are many questions about how would history be different if Ukraine had somehow held on to those weapons. So in other words, you had this moment at the end of the Cold War where you had this willingness to cooperate on democratization, on the spread of market economies, on nuclear disarmament, and then it falls apart in the course of the 1990s through a series of self-harming choices on Russia's part, particularly by Boris Yeltsin, the former Russian president, to begin a brutal, brutal war in Chechnya, which sadly now looks like a precursor to what's going on. Uh, you see a very corrupt process of privatization in Russia. So you have a series of self-harming choices in Russia, which I think are the most important factor in deteriorating relations. But you also have decisions on the West to basically avoid defining a place for Russia in the post-Cold War security order. And these are what I talk about in my book, Not One Inch. So there is this tragic arc in the 90s where um, this, this moment of cooperation was lost. The way I put it in the book is that cold wars are not short-lived affairs. So thaws are precious. 
and neither side made the best use of the thaw in the 1990s. And now, sadly, we are living with the consequences today. Now that Putin has made clear, now that Moscow is no longer silent, now that Putin has made clear that he's not happy with the fact that Russia had no acceptable birth to find for it, now he's decided to force one with violence, which is truly, truly tragic. Okay, great. Uh, let me shift the gear a little bit and and uh, and move to the, the current affairs. Um, you know, we are in the in the fourth week of uh, of this tragic war, uh, with thousands of um, innocent people uh, being killed, cities destroyed, uh, millions of refugees uh, in neighboring countries, and every day West is buying energy from Russia, uh, which is worth. $450 million. Uh, so we are de facto financing uh, uh, Putin's war. Uh, Olaf Scholz today in the Bundestag uh, said that energy ban would uh, trigger recession and, and there is big disagreement about this among uh, uh, business uh, uh, class in, in Germany. I wonder, uh, Sigmar Gabriel, uh, what do you think about this? Uh, uh, can we afford the ban on energy? How the sanctions, if they go farther, can can affect the uh, European economy? It would definitely uh, affect uh, the European, especially the German economy, but not only the German, look to Bulgaria. They are dependent by 100% on, on Russian energy flows. You see what would happen in Italy. And the fear of, uh, I would say, the majority of the uh, political leaders in Europe, not the East Europeans, by the way, they are pushing hard uh, to to also sanctionize uh, and to cut the gas and oil pipelines but but the majority are afraid that the consequences would hurt the 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 european economy much more than it hurts russia uh, uh, or uh, that european citizens would not be willing to suffer as much as uh, russian citizens are willing to do or used to do and that at the end of the day uh, uh, we would lose um, uh, the, the social um, support for our sanctions against Russia. If people would become unemployed, if German economy uh, would go down, by the way, then we would not be able to support other European member states, which will, will be necessary during the next months and years. I mean, we saw that uh, after the pandemic, we fortunately had the agreement uh, with the help of the former Chancellor Angela Merkel <clears throat> to this European Recovery Fund. Um, I'm sure we will have a second one now, uh, because if not, the other uh, economies in Europe would suffer much more than, than Germany uh, would suffer. But if the Germany's uh, economic engine would go down, uh, it's maybe more in the interest uh, of, of Putin than in the interest of the stability of the West. That's what the majority of the of the European uh, government's thing, but there's a bit, but if Russia really would use, for example, biological or chemical weapons, or would use a tactical nuclear weapon, maybe not for a real mass destruction, but only to show that it is willing to use it, uh, then of course it will change the situation dramatically. But then we have to be very honest we will go into a deep recession in Europe. Uh, that will be the consequence. And uh, of course, uh, Germany and others, they try to get access to other energy suppliers. But if you ask, for example, the Qataris, they will tell you that they are only, are only flexible by 10, 15% of their uh, gas uh, production. They could double their size, but therefore the, they would need two or three years. So that's the reason why uh, the, the, the majority of the European leaders are reluctant to this idea. But in the case of other events, uh, uh, this is also uh, part of, of the answer. I mean, the big question is, what will, the, what will Europe together with the United States do okay. if Russia uses the next step? Uh, I mean, it's impossible not to answer. It's impossible. Uh, on the other hand, we want we don't want to escalate into a nuclear war. And then I would say the next step would be to cut off oil and gas. Uh, but then you need in Germany and some others 
a Winston Churchill speech about what's coming uh, in a society which for decades lives in a very comfortable situation. Um, to see how big the shift in Germany is between the speech of the German chancellor two weeks ago and what happened before, you can go back, we had in the, in the last autumn, we had our general elections. We had 300 minutes debates of journalists, media journalists with the three candidates who wanted to be the next chancellor. Only 15 minutes, they were asked about international affairs, only 15 minutes. And all 15 minutes, it was about Afghanistan, nothing more. So the Germans through their economic success, we are we're the, we're the biggest winner of, of globalization. We only saw the rest of the world through the corner of our eyes. We, don't, we did not put the global development in the center of our perspective. This is the real dramatic change in our country, not the speech of the chancellor, but the whole society is moving. And um, my, my hope is that they, that they would be willing even to go the next step by sanctionizing gas and oil if Putin uh, wants to test our unity. But for the time being, the leaders are reluctant because of the backlash we would uh, feel in Europe. By the way, much more than the US would feel it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have a number of questions and comments um, uh, about China. And um, um, let me direct this to Dimitri uh, because you know Greece was not all, all a great friend of, of uh, Soviet Union and Russia in, in the past, but also is a great friend of China now uh, with uh, a lot of Chinese uh, investment coming through Greece to Europe. Uh, um, uh, so um, what's the role of, uh, of, of China? How uh, uh, dangerous uh, uh, may be uh, if China takes uh, really side of, uh, of Russia? Uh, in this uh, in this conflict, um, uh, can you uh, can you envision that they will be just sitting uh, on the fence and and doing by and large nothing, on, or or they can uh, really move and uh, and and change the balance uh, in you know not not in favor of uh, uh, of the West in this. Yes, um, allow me just to underline the last phrase of uh, Mr. Gabriel that this issue of uh, sanctioning the energy sector of Russia can potentially divide the West between Europe and America in the sense that uh, uh, Europe is much more dependent uh, uh, compared to America that imports very little from uh, uh, Russia. And this can become an issue of discord uh, uh, in uh, the Western alliance, especially if the pressure continues and if there is escalation in Ukraine, uh, given the fact that we have decided not to intervene militarily, we are left uh, with the sanction as the main weapon to uh, counteract uh, Russia's uh, behavior. And since we have sanctioned most of the sectors, uh, the one uh, really big one left is the energy. There will be more talk on that uh, side as the conflict continues to escalate and to deteriorate, I am uh, afraid. The same goes for the one uh, uh, NATO member that has refused to uh, put up sanctions uh, uh, against Russia, uh, uh, that being Turkey, uh, uh, creating a big loophole uh, in the effectiveness of uh, uh, sanctioning Russia, since now most international flights, a lot of banking transactions and uh, trade goes through uh, Turkey, and therefore while the Finns, the Latvians, the Estonians, the Lithuanians, the Poles, the Germans pay the price of these sanctions, there is one country in the NATO alliance that makes a profit out of this uh, dreadful uh, situation. And it will be spotlighted more as uh, uh, the situation uh, deteriorates, uh, I'm afraid. Now, vis-a-vis -vis China, and obviously a very interesting question is what India uh, might do as the biggest democracy 
uh, in this uh, alliance, global alliances of democracies versus, versus autocracies. It has refused to uh, condemn uh, Russia in the UN, uh, and it's an interesting uh, choice. But let's come to uh, uh, China. Now, China is obviously uh, on a very first level a winner of this uh, uh, mess for a number of reasons, uh, because it um, creates a problem uh, in the West, in Europe, away from the Pacific and away from the anti-Chinese alliance that Biden formed back in September, the famous AUKUS with Australia and uh, uh, Britain. Uh, and uh, it uh, uh, obviously the conflict brings Russia much closer to China for a number of reasons, economically and uh, uh, strategically. Uh, however, there are some caveats in this uh, reasoning. First, China, I heard Mr. Gabriel uh, saying with some uh, bravado uh, that Germany is the big beneficiary of the globalization. Obviously, this is true, but if there is one big, big, big beneficiary of globalization the last 30 years, this is undoubtedly uh, China. Let me remind our audience that uh, the Chinese and the Russian economies were equal of equal size 30 years ago. Today, China is 12 times, 12 times the size of Russia's. It shows the extraordinary growth and the extraordinary benefits of China from uh, globalization. So, whereas the jingoists uh, uh, in Beijing might be happy uh, on a very first level with everything happening uh, uh, in Europe. They are also concerned on better thinking about undermining a global system out of which they benefited so much and they managed to uh, uh, enrich uh, uh, China in an unprecedented pace, right? So uh, China traditionally is against change of borders, against uh, this kind of uh, uh, revisionism for a number of reasons that have to do with the internal uh, situation inside China. So there is this uh, uh, caveat. Furthermore, Russia's uh, pivoting towards China uh, can only happen as a junior partner of uh, uh, China, not as an equal partner. Um, there are a few million Russians in uh, uh, Siberia, all the way to Vladivostok, facing hundreds, hundreds of Chinese uh, well-fed and uh, uh, much richer than in the past. I mean, if you see that border, uh, the balance of power is definitely on the Chinese side, right? So there are issues. Uh, uh, there are issues there, but for sure, on a very primary strategic um, uh, level, uh, uh, China is welcoming this uh, um, alliance uh, with uh, 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 Moscow and has uh, uh, refused even to talk about uh, an invasion or a war in Ukraine. It keeps on using the Putin's uh, terminology about a special military operation. Uh, the Chinese uh, media have censored uh, much of the uh, reporting uh, from Ukraine and so on and, uh, and so forth. Uh, Mary has uh, uh, intervention on the China question. Just something briefly from a historian, specifically from my friend, Professor Arnie Westad of Yale, uh, because Jago, you asked me to talk about historical considerations. Arnie Westad has been making a point about China that I think is significant and bears repeating. Uh, China is obviously hugely important in this conflict. She is currently Putin's most important friend. And if she would put pressure on Putin to end this conflict, it might actually have an effect. And as Arnie Westad has pointed out, this would be in China's interest because there is a very unfortunate historical parallel here, and it is to the beginning of the 20th century. Back then, at the beginning of the 20th century, there was one power that was clearly going to dominate the coming century, 
because its industry was rising, it had cutting edge technology, its military was increasing, and that country was Germany. And then Germany under Kaiser Wilhelm made the tragic decision to support a crumbling empire on its border that wanted to attack a smaller neighbor, meaning of course the Austro-Hungarian empire in attacking Serbia. And that led to World War I and dragged Germany down into the abyss. And instead of dominating the 20th century, Germany was ruined and uh, the 20th century was dominated by the United States. So I know that in Beijing, they're very conscious of history. And I think they should be conscious of this parallel and not make the same choice now about supporting a crumbling neighbor next door. It is not in their interest. And so I hope that American diplomats are making that clear to China as a way of making it clear that China should change its position and help to end this terrible violence because the results could be unpredictable for China as well as for the rest of the world. Thank you, Mark, please. I agree that China did not decide it, um, how to behave because on the one hand side uh, for them, it's to get Russia, uh, it's a low hanging fruit for them. There is an old rivalry between China and Russia and to get Russia uh, so cheap, uh, there are some parts of the Chinese leadership which would say that's in our interest because to have, have no conflicts with Russia on one side means that China could also concentrate on their maritime interests in the Indo-Pacific. On the other hand side, they are happy that the US again has to be engaged in Europe because they do not can concentrate their own power to the Indo-Pacific. So that's the one side. The other side is um, what's the, the biggest interest of a Chinese leader? To, to, to show his citizens that every year um, they become a bit richer, a bit more um, uh, closer to social security and, and um, uh, uh, friction in the world trade, a disruption in the global economy. That's not in the interest of Chinese leadership. Um, they, they are not interested in having skyrocketing, skyrocketing um, uh, energy prices. So that's the other side of the car. And they don't want to come close to be... Um, to, 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 to not to respect U.S. sanctions because they don't want to be part of the, of the war uh, um, or by secondary sanctions from the U.S. So th there is a struggle inside China. And I would say as long as they do not see a real chance to step up as a kind of mediator, they will only have rhetorical speeches about peace. Uh, uh, if they would see a chance to be the, the mediator of a ceasefire or, or a peace process or settlement, then of course they would step up because it would be the biggest um, uh, um, uh, the, the biggest thing uh, of Chinese foreign policy since uh, the founding of the People's Republic of China. So they would try to do this, but as long as they do not see that Putin is willing to negotiate, they they will only have rhetorical speeches and say, stay on the sidelines, uh, looking what's happening on the ground. Uh, but uh, I, I would agree that that there are two sides in China which are struggling. The one which is happy to get this fruit uh, very cheap, uh, and the other is who are maybe on the long term interest don't don't want to come into economic troubles because China first become old because before it becomes rich and strong. And, and that's the challenge that they are uh, um, uh, heading uh, in the next years. Thank you. I, um, I'm very sorry to say that, that unfortunately we uh, reached our time limit and um, uh, our guests have uh, other uh, engagements so we cannot uh, uh, really uh, go on uh, with uh, with the panel. Um, as you all have seen, we just only scratched the surface of all the important questions and, and problems uh, which we are facing uh, because of that uh, completely unbelievable uh, and, and brutal invasion of, uh, of Ukraine. Um, we will be back with, uh, with another events uh, in this uh, series. And let me thank uh, so much uh, 
uh, to Mary Sarotti, Sigmar Gabriel, and uh, Dimitris Kiridis uh, for uh, participating uh, uh, in this panel. Thank you so much, and thank you all for uh, for joining us uh, for the discussion.